Uh, do you want me to start? Just, okay, hey, I want to welcome everybody out there that's listening online as well as, you know, the folks who are here in the room. And if you can come to the room, please do. And if you can't, please tell everybody to put on their computers or what have you. This is an amazing book, Standing in a Hard Rain, Joe Ice. I've known Joe for a lot of years, and uh, I knew part of the history, but I didn't know all of it, and I definitely didn't know what a powerful writer he is. Uh, as a writer, he just blew me away. <laughs> I, uh, I was completely blown away. It's, it's, the history in it is, I mean, you will learn more than you can ever imagine reading this book. But, you know, the way he writes it and the way he puts it down is so, so unbelievably poetic and creative. Uh, it's bigger than a page turner. I strongly recommend everybody get a copy of this book. Um, I guarantee you, you will learn a whole lot more than you ever imagined that you will learn. And with that, I, you know, I'm going to turn it over to him. Just get yourself a copy of the book and tell everybody. Once you read it, tell everybody to get a copy of the book. Because there's information in this book that everybody should know about. Well, thank you, Vacha. Uh, uh, welcome to my audience. I can't thank you enough for coming. And, and to the people um, out there at the other end of the, other end of the electrons, uh, I wanted to start out by... Uh, Sharing the uh, sharing the love here a little bit, and uh, letting Vachek, who's one of the most interesting poets that I've ever had the opportunity to hear, a jazz musician, uh, political person, and just uh, uh, a great uh, a great power and a great mover uh, for me. And, and when I came back here and was trying to connect politically in the Bay Area after a while, um, she definitely uh, uh, plugged me into the main line. So I'm going to start with. Uh, Stepping back from the microphone and letting her read a little bit of work um, in, in thanks for her coming and, and hosting me and supporting me and, and saying so many wonderful things about me. What, what more can I do than give her a chance to read? Hey, I'm truly honored. I'm going to do three things. This first one I'm going to just call on romanticism because folks are always talking about us poets of color and we don't write enough about romance, you know. And so this is on romanticism. I would like to fly like a hummingbird floating on inspiration and sing mystical songs of love, standing still in midair on a cushion of metaphors, and I'd love to lie back and dance on the wind, philosophizing about life and the joy of living without having to worry about where the next meal is coming from. I, I admit it. I say I admit it. I would love to write pretty poetry <clears throat> about pretty flowers and the beauty of freedom and have the time to enjoy it, but pretty flowers like freedom are pretty rare around here in my part of the city, where even dreams cost more than I can afford. And the only flowers I get to see live in store windows or lay dead in the streets covered with wine and snot and God knows what. But our beautiful children are watching. They watch like urban butterflies hibernating in concrete cocoons. They watch and grow and grow and watch and watch and grow and grow and watch and never stop dreaming of becoming poets. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> forgive me, the great con John Coltrane's birthday is coming up on the 23rd, and a whole bunch of us are paying tribute to him at the Oaktown Jazz Workshops, um, and those who are interested, you can look on the web and check it out, or my website, avachi.org. I, I did a thing for him. Um, Train was a whole lot more complex than, than folks realize. He was an unbelievable intellectual. Um... So was Bird, by the way. <laughs> but um, he became a guru for a lot of folks. But folks don't really realize that he had many gurus that made him who he was. And most people don't know about those gurus, and they should, especially one that I mentioned here, the first one I mentioned. So I call this Trainsplorations, and I think you're going to like what we do at Oaktown Workshops with it. And I start with a quote by John Coltrane. <clears throat> My music is a spiritual expression of what I am. My faith, my being, I want to uplift and inspire. John Coltrane. Train explorations. John Coltrane was a new kind of phenomenon. A musical, mystical, spiritual, inexplicable phenomenon. A bigger than life mystic man with a heart full of passionate spirituality. Train was an artist. 
a driven, obsessive, versatile artist on a mission. A mission that included beautiful ballads to creations that could only be defined as transcendent trainscapes. The man was a musical composition in progress, a composition beyond comprehension. John Coltrane was a many-sided creative enigma, a gentle soul on a lifelong journey of healing on the road to learning, always searching. Searching, trying to find himself in his place in all the sacred mysteries of the universe, train sporting himself out of the dungeons of addiction and liberating himself through a relentless creativity. John Coltrane's journey began as a dream in the church of his mother's womb. He came to us through the musical majesty of the black church and the reckless bravado of Charlie Yardbird Parker, forever transporting himself through the southern nightmares on African pentatonic scales and as the joy, the pain, the rage, and years of tears of generations of murdered black children came pouring out of his soul through his horn. But enamored and inspired by the concept of the sacred infinite, he elevated himself. He transcended the madness through the international language of music and was kick-started into musical fearlessness by the amazing piano stylings of Hassan Ibn Ali and the harmonic daring of Sunrise John Gilmore. The rigorous practice and melodic dissonance of Thelonious Monk taught him all about the gifts of daring and discipline while the spiritual intensity of Ravi Shankar Sitar introduced him to the rhythmic majesty of Babatunde Olatunji's Drums of Passion, and the miraculous, cosmic, magical, and otherworldliness of the ingenious Juno Lewis legitimized his internalized spiritual consciousness so his saxophone could finally digest and sing it all as he elevated himself in our lives through the strength of his song. His life was a sacred journey, a prayer a love supreme, and though the man John Coltrane has transcended, his spirit is still alive. I say his spirit is still alive and strong and forever reborn every day in our hearts. And last but not least, <clears throat> the we of us, um, I come from a culture that believes that we are because we are. If it wasn't for the we, I don't exist. So this is called the we of us. When I write, I dress yesterday's visions in today's rhythms and I tap dance all over the page with every poem. And with every single word I write, I am reliving everything these culturalist cultures have tried their best to bury and replace with the sadness of their emptiness. And I continue to sing keeping the ancestors alive by singing their songs, expanding tradition with new words in strange lands. I am the recognition of all the traditions the soulless have tried to erase, but with a giant thank you in our hearts, we joyfully climb out of the acceptable respectability of their passionless graveyards. And we are reborn in every poem we write. We sing to you through the rhythmic fire of samba. Every rumba reinstates your presence in our DNA. We cry the unashamed truth of the bluest of blues exploding like La Womba in the face of colonial insanity and boldly fight the power with doo-wop, hip-hop, and jazz. I refuse to silently accept the unacceptable suicidal madness the de denies the demise of our existence when every single day I can taste the we of us striving. I say striving, striving. We are more than just surviving. We are cultural alchemists, an undeniable force of creativity and motion. And through our creativity, we decolonize our legacy and free our minds and spirits. We are a whole lot more than you and me. It's all about the you in me, the me and you, the we of us, writing our way out of the delusion of manifest destiny, self-righteous madness, and reinvigorating the dreams our ancestors died for. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Joel, and he definitely reinvigorates the dreams a whole bunch of ancestors died for. Um, and once again, I tell you, you must get a copy of this book. Tell them a little bit about your radio show and about that Coltrane event.
Um, I do two radio programs. One is uh, La Verdad Musical. That's every Friday from noon to three. And it's basically Pan-Africanist, but I also like some other music. So you might hear some Japanese music and, and other stuff in there. And then on Tuesday nights at KPFA, I do a program called Bebop, Kubop, and the Musical Truth. And that's a jazz, Latin jazz program. And the, um, the train event is on the 23rd at the Oaktown Jazz Workshops in Jack London Square. And you can look at my website, avacha.org, and, you know, get all the information. And uh, please be there because we are going to be doing train every kind of way possible. <laughs> We've got some amazing musicians, and we worked on some amazing things. And and if you didn't recognize some of the people like Hassan Ibn Ali, please look him up. I don't know why that man was not one of the most famous musicians that ever lived, except that he was so far ahead of his time that he sort of got brushed under the, the rug. But anyway, um, with that, I'm going to shut up. Joe, blow our minds. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's kind of a tough act to follow, and I'm glad, indeed. Um, I definitely appreciate the praise. Of course, you know, you always think your work is great, but it's better if other people think it's great, because uh, what do I know? I just wrote it. Uh, the book, uh, uh, Standing in a Hard Rain, of course, refers to, uh, refers to, um, uh, Dylan's song about a hard rain is going to fall. And uh, we found that it was falling all around us as we grew up back in the 60s. My book starts with uh, my life as a young kid. I uh, grew up in a household that was already fairly political. Um, my grandfather was an organizer for the uh, uh, Garment Workers Union before World War I, and my grandmother was a suffragette. My dad tried to join the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and ended up on the docks in San Francisco with Harry Bridges. And he grew up, uh, my mom grew, brought me up to uh, uh, finish my vegetables and never cross a picket line. So that was kind of my home, my, my, my upbringing. Uh, and uh, we want to bring that the consciousness back. So the book starts with that and goes all the way up to, um, you know, pretty much fairly current times. I used to tell all these stories at parties. And uh, when, uh, when uh, Donald Trump, who I call the stump, when the stump got elected, uh, I would get phone calls and emails from people saying, you know, those stories you used to tell at parties, you ought to write those down. You'd put that in a book. And uh, so the impetus to do this was from other people urging me. I guess those stories had stuck with them. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the genesis of, of the book, came from other people encouraging me to do so. And um, I have had in my life, one thing I discovered very young was, uh, uh, if you could ask all the soldiers who had died in the wars, and they stood up and came out of their graves, they tell you that history is personal. And uh, that's important. It's not about other people, and it's not about the news on the headlines. It's about what we do with our lives every day. And um, I found in my life an opportunity through circumstances that I was in to choose whether I was going to stand on the sidelines or get in the street. And uh, I made the choice of the latter on many occasions. And I also found by some incredible luck to have uh, encountered people who became very important in my life personally and became important politically and they influenced me and some of those uh, some of those uh, stories uh, come out in here i'd like to start with a little bit about when i was really young and and how things came down what a what a what a little boy i was okay the section is called hot coffee and union troubles i was 10 years old it was a freezing cold, stormy winter day in Rockville, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C., where the snow can be like wet cement. While I suited up to go to school, an African-American garbage man knocked on our back door and asked my mother for a glass of water. This was pretty brave. White people would throw away a glass after a black person used it if they gave it to him at all. He could have lost his job. He must have known my folks were okay or he wouldn't have even dared. There were no black people in our neighborhood, no black children in any of my schools. I never saw any at the grocery store or the movies. This was Jim Crow America. My mother asked him, my mother asked him in, gave him a glass of water, and then poured him a cup of hot coffee. She passed him the cream, sugar, and a spoon, just as if he was one of our friends. After he left, wide-eyed, I asked why she did that. She turned to me and she said, 
You give a person what they deserve, whether they ask for it or not. And that's pretty much the bottom line in terms of the, the politics of those days. Uh, another kind of event from those days, in terms of uh, me uh, absorbing that information, this was about three years later. The story is called Jesus and I Go Mano a Mano. In 1958, I was in the seventh grade at Belt Junior High School in Silver Springs, Maryland, 10 miles outside of Washington. It was required that the New Testament be read in class every homeroom. When your name was called, you had to go up and read from the New Testament. In that class of 30 students, there were at least 16 Jewish kids, maybe 20 if you count the ones with blonde hair who were trying to pass as Gentiles. In front of me sat Ruby Compton. Ruby was a 13-year-old blonde with a sensuous pout and early noteworthy curves. Ruby looked how Marilyn Monroe must have looked at that same age. That morning, Ruby read some of the Bible, an incongruous image in itself. Then it was my turn. Our teacher, Mr. Schusler, had been a Marine in the Korean War. He was a wrestling coach. He was over six feet tall and built like a weightlifter with a blonde flat top haircut and hands like sledgehammers. He was a nice guy. With those hands, he could afford to be a nice guy. Mr. Schusler called my name and asked, held out the Bible for me to read. Now, I was about... 12 and a half, 13 years old at this happened. I have no idea what possessed me. Perhaps I was channeling my television hero and moral compass at the time, Davy Crockett, who always said, be sure you're right, then go ahead. No thanks, I said, I'll pass. I could feel the shocked cold stares all around me. Mr. Schusler's voice got deeper. He said, it's your turn. Again, I said, no thanks, I'll pass. It wasn't my holy book. Miraculously, at that moment, the bell rang. I was saved. However, somebody must have called my house. When I got home, my mom asked me the whole story. The next day, my parents went with me to school. The office was crawling with more lawyers than ants on a chocolate cake. At that age, I was mostly interested in getting a peek down Ruby Compton's blouse. I'd never heard about the prayer in the school's controversy. It must have pushed a pretty hot button by opening my big mouth. This became the story of my life. On the next mo morning, home, Monday homeroom, instead of passing the Bible around, Mr. Schusler, staring daggers at me, said, you don't have to read the Bible. It's voluntary. The last word sounded like a curse. My innocent action had contributed to a shift in the entire school district, perhaps even beyond. A single small action by one person at the right moment can change things big time. I'd become that one can on a five-mile front line of the First Amendment. I'm pretty sure Ruby Compton didn't give a damn, but I had a hunch that my reputation as a troublemaker was going to follow me. I prayed to be airlifted out of there. My prayers were answered. That summer, we moved out to California. So that was kind of like me as, as a young boy and I have no idea what I was getting into. Uh, I went through high school, I went through college, I was involved in the anti-war movement and some stuff for the free speech movement. Uh, got connected with, uh, uh, I went to San Jose State in 1964, and one of my college uh, uh, friends at the time was a guy, was the only Mexican guy I ever knew. His name was Luis Valdez. This was before he started the Teatro Campesino. I had no idea. Uh, and so that was the kind of a unexpected serendipity were in my life. Previous to that, when I was in high school, I was on the debate team. And one of the guys that I debated against was at the other high school, and that guy named David Harris, who then became leader of the National Draft Resistance. So I knew both of these people well before that and, and ended up uh, you know, working with them. Well, through my college years, eventually I ended up at San Francisco State because some of the schools that I went to, that I'd applied to for graduate school, did not offer me enough money and a couple had turned me down. San Francisco State was the right place to be. I wanted to do political theater. Uh, there was a lot of theater in San Francisco, there was political theater in San Francisco, and since it was in state in California, it was reasonable, and it was far enough away from home in Fresno that my parents couldn't drop in on me. So there were a lot of advantages there. Uh, when I was at Fresno State before that, uh, uh, as, as an undergraduate, uh, I met a guy named Frank Virgis. Frank Virgis was my philosophy teacher, and Frank uh, I taught a class in philosophy, and um, during the early Vietnam War, 65, 66, he wanted to organize what's called a Vietnam Day, Vietnam Day Committee, uh, where they would have speeches either for or against a complete discussion of the whole Vietnam War. 
Um, it would include, a, you know, everybody from the Young Republicans to, to, uh, uh, the, to the leftists. And um, he was going to organize that. He was excited about it. People were excited about it. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the university, uh, uh, the college threatened him with his job if he went, went through with it. So uh, um, they canceled that. And he was, the rest of the semester, he was really downhearted and he was very lackluster. He left the school and I have no idea where he ended up. This was 1965, 66. We roll ahead to, uh, to um, late 1968 and I'm at San Francisco State and I find myself at the San Francisco State strike. I did not know that was going on when I got there. I come there just to be, uh, become uh, famous beyond my wildest dreams and found myself in the strike. Um, we ran from the cops, a lot of you know the stories about that. We ran from the cops. There were 600 of them out there. They were on horseback. There were cops with machine guns on the roof. Uh, the phalanxes of cops could run through the crowd and all of a sudden break off. You had no idea when they were coming at you. And, uh, and uh, but at that point in time, I was trying to decide exactly how political my life was going to be. The Vietnam War uh, uh, was going on, uh, and I was uh, being a con I was uh, applied for my conscientious objector status. I was paying attention to the grape strike down in Cal Fresno. And uh, it was a pinnacle point in my life. And at that particular moment in time, uh, I had, a, a, I had a, an, an experience there, which was another one of my serendipities. While the strike at San Francisco State ground on, I awaited the determination of my conscientious objective status. I was depressed and very scared. Then my CO classification came through. I would still have to serve, but I could choose a social service agency stateside. I can't tell you what a relief that was. On one of the later days of the strike, I dodged the cops a few times already that day. I watched them busting some guy out of the middle of the crowd. As they cuffed him and stuffed him into a cop car, he lifted his head. He was probably maybe 40 yards, 50 yards away from me, down there, like about where the cross the street is. Somehow we made eye contact. It was Frank Virgis, my former philosophy professor from Fresno State. I had no idea he was now teaching at San Francisco State. Before they pushed him into the police car, he smiled and yelled, I see you got the point of the philosophy lectures, Mr. Ice. <laughs> this encounter with Frank Virgis was, was when the decision to devote my life to taking part in a power structure profiting from unfairness became visceral. I didn't become radicalized in a single moment. It didn't happen by taking a class, reading a book, or hearing a single speech. It happened by answering my heart. It happened while running from the cops who were chasing me for trying to make this a fair country. It caught me like a tidal wave. I'd seen people get it watching an agitprop performance, connecting their own lives to the bigger picture. The people in power were relentlessly driving the juggernaut that crushed the poor and disadvantaged. So this was when I made a decision to become involved in political theater. Shortly thereafter, I was invited to join the Farm Workers Theater, and that was a very pivotal moment in my life. But things like running into Frank Virgis five years later with his, uh, with his uh, clever quip is kind of the story of my life. A lot of what, what had happened. Uh, I'm going to roll ahead now to, uh, oh, that's a fun one. Okay. Uh, Uh, when I got involved in Fresno, I joined the draft resistance and worked with the draft resistance as an organizer while working with the Farm Workers Theater. Uh, uh, so I was pretty much a full-time organizer, and, and I was immersed in it pretty deep, about up to here. Um, I lived out at the draft resistance community. We had four farmhouses out in the middle of a fig orchard uh, outside uh, north of town near the college. Um, um, which was a, a nice little community. We had, we had a printing press out there and we printed um, uh, leaflets and we held classes and did counseling workshops and all the rest of it. Did potluck dinners, which were major organizing uh, activities out there. Um, but we were always aware that we were under some kind of surveillance in one form or another. And there's a kind of an interesting story here. I've read this before and I think it's, it's kind of a fun one. Um, it's called The Phone Company Helps Out. As far as the FBI was concerned, anyone who didn't vote Republican was a commie, probably a Jew, and maybe even a queer. In my case, it was two out of three. The FBI was sure that we were working for an evil empire, even if we didn't know it. Their job was to save us from ourselves. They couldn't embrace the idea that we had, had a right to object to the course our government was taking and that all the facts showed we were right. On second thought, that's probably what pissed them off. 
Tapping phone conversations was and still is one of their primary tools, hoping to connect you to the big controversy in the sky. Hence the invention of the wiretap court order. For this permission, uh, uh, lawmen needed probable cause. This chicken or egg situation means that there had to be some kind of surveillance before the invasive process could legally begin. Early computers were used to record repeated contact with specific phone numbers that were already on their list. This record supposedly gave the G-men probable cause. How those people got on the list in the first place was never questioned. The number of associated individuals ran into the hundreds of thousands, probably millions. The process worked like a comedy written by Franz Kafka. If a suspected person called the same number several times, the computer assumes this number is linked to nefarious activities. The fun fact about the official enemies list is that once you're on the list, you never drop off. One of the obvious problems with this system is that the content of the call is not considered. There was a pizza place down the road on Blackstone Avenue we called nearly every week. They're probably still on the enemies list, even though their four meat pizza is fantastic. Does anybody ever check to see why the first call was ever recorded? Don't be silly. There's this job security thing for the government. Once a phone number shows up on some magic number of times, the feds listen in on the calls. This requires that they install equipment on your line. They used to be a guy with the headphones in the, this used to be the guy in the headphones in the basement of your apartment building or in a phony utility truck outside. Between my draft resistance work, the farm workers theater, calls with civil rights and black power groups, and my family who had leftist leanings as far back as the Great Depression, my phone was overflowing with red hot numbers, and I do mean red. There was often a utility truck, company truck at the end of our street working on the wires. So clever. With the equipment back then when we dialed or answered a call, there was, this is, a, this is a, a analog equipment. Um, when you, when you, with the equipment back then, we dialed our or answered a call. There were so many audible clicks on the line, we had to wait until they all finished hooking up before we could begin a conversation. There was a small power drop caused by each wiretap. Sometimes the power draw from the multiple devices was so strong that the call faded in and out or disconnected entirely. One night, my fellow draft counselor, Ron Thiessen, was so angry at all of this that he telephoned the phone company. I was sitting across the room. The following exchange took place. Ron, is this the phone company repair department? Voice on the other end, yes. How can we help you? You can disconnect all the damn wiretaps. There's so many clicks on the line, I have to wait to ta start talking. Sometimes our calls even disconnect. Voice on the other end, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, give me a break. I see the trucks out here all the time with leads running down from the connection box. Voice on the other end, oh, you must be out at the resistance house. Our technician said, don't worry, the tabs shouldn't interfere with your calls. <laughs> One might consider that the amount of surveillance is a backhanded barometer of one's radical effectiveness. In a perverse way, showing up on their list might be proof that you're doing something worth their attention. As the Dalai Lama has said, if you think that you can't make a difference with continual individual activism, that a small, insistent voice is not important, Try sleeping in a dark room with one mosquito. Okay. This kind of interpersonal connection continued. I want to talk a little bit about my experience at People's Park in Berkeley. Um, um, we found ourselves there when I was down at the draft resistance. We found ourselves up. People's Park all came up in our trucks and our VW vans and were part of the demonstrations in People's Park. Uh, at People's Park in Berkeley, uh, the governor and, uh, and, and, and the rest of the, and the state brought in a lot of uh, uh, National Guardsmen from small towns around the area uh, because they had an attitude about students. You know, we were all dope smoking hippies and, you know, going to waste the state's money because we were just laying around uh, going to college. Uh, um, the contradiction there is that they themselves on their jobs were talking about uh, sending their kids to college. I don't know, you figure it out. So uh, when we got there and we were demonstrating, you know, we were in, in the marches, we discovered that uh, some of the guardsmen there were actually from Fresno. And this turned into a really interesting experience. Uh, two days after May 15, now known as Bloody Thursday, most of the resistance community and others from Fresno traveled to Berkeley. 
Don Teeter, Patrick Conroy, and Paul Donham and I were there. These were roommates. Okay. Uh, thousands filled the streets around Telegraph Avenue with rolls of sod appeared. The truck stopped and sod was handed down to those who were directly behind the truck and laid over the street, creating another park. They put, they put the sod in the street. It was kind of fun. Uh, Bill Hague, the photographer for the image of that story, was a participant in the sod maneuver and attests to my account of that unique action. As we got to Telegraph Avenue, we were confronted by rows of National Guardsmen with their rifles out, uh, plexiglass riot masks in place. Then the order came for them to fix bayonets. Jesus fucking Christ, they're going to charge the crowd with bayonets. After the murder of James Rector, we didn't know what to think, but we didn't, know, we didn't back down. We advanced to within four feet of the guardsmen. They were told to take one step forward. The guardsman directly in front of me advanced. He put his bayonet to my throat, resting it on my chest, just below my Adam's apple. Then he looked at me. This weekend soldier was Chuck Hess, part of the National Guard unit from Fresno. Chuck and I had been junior high school friends together back in 1960. Chuck and I held eye contact, poised on a personal knife point of this dangerous moment. He had, sweat during around his, he had sweat pouring down his face around his helmet. Sure as shit, this felt like civil war. As I looked into the blue of his eyes, I knew that history was where you put your body. Mine would be on the front line. Some of the guys in uniform on either side, on either side of him were also from Fresno. Some recognized me. I saw eyes waver. They were having trouble keeping a grip on their rifles. Eventually, they were ordered to stand down. Chuck stepped back with his rifles held across his chest. We moved away and continued our march to the park. Nobody died that day. In a nearly twilight zone coincidence, one year later, Chuck and I crossed paths again. This is very strange. I'll talk about it for a second. I was arrested in Fresno uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the invasion of uh, Cambodia, uh, the week of, uh, the week of uh, Kent State the murders. The officer that arrested me was Chuck Hess. So it seemed like we had, as uh, Vonnegut says, we had a crass together. And I have no idea where he is now, but he, I'm sure he remembers that because he knew who I was and I knew who he was. Well, there's another little story about things got more radical at that particular time. I'm having a good time. Did you say, hey, Chuck, uh, how what? are we going? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, the thing, there's an odd story I vaguely remember after that one of those dropout things. I have a vague memory that I used to go to a dance club that I think Chuck ran and owned, that he totally got out of the whole police thing. I don't know whether our exchange made him do that, but I'm sure I could see him with a blonde flat top and the blue eyes running that club. I see him now who was wearing a, a T-shirt and, and shorts, you know, and I'm sure it was him because he came right up to me and made personal contact in that club. So I have a feeling he tuned in, turned on, and dropped way out. <laughs> okay, now, here's another one. Um, as things deteriorated in the movement in that day, some of the people, all the people in our area were all conscientious objectors or draft resistors. Um, we were a political household. Nobody ever kept any drugs in the house. We were careful about who was at our meetings, all of the rest of that stuff. At one point in time, a couple of these guys who were my friends uh, decided they would become uh, a lot more radical. And one guy actually brought weapons into the house. He joins the, uh, the radical unit, he joined the RU, and he brought guns in the house. Didn't ask me, didn't ask my roommate, he just did that. Um, uh, we, had to, we had to deal with that. But there's a situation connected with that that's kind of interesting. Okay, um, I'm going to tell this story and we'll stop and then we'll see how far we can go here. Um, this is a story called Carla. One day, Carla Wilkins hitchhiked to our front door, knocked and walked in. Carla was very blonde and blue-eyed with a husky voice and a healthy farm girl figure. She had a warm laugh that could melt the statue. Carla was a very grounded young woman. She confessed that she was a California Youth Authority escapee, turned into them for being a habitual runaway. Her drunken stepfather had been sexually stalking her. Running away was her only protection. The streets of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other cities were crawling with girls living out the same scenario. I hung out with her for a day or so, then Paul showed up. After they laid eyes on each other, that was the last I saw them for two days. Carla moved in with Paul and began baking bread for the house when she wasn't upstairs with him. They were genuinely smitten with each other. I never saw Paul so happy. 
Paul knew that his only chance with Carla was to get her to negotiate something with the CIA. Carla's Uncle Marty was a rookie cop in Fresno. Marty and I had also known each other in high school. He liked Paul, and he respected that we made contact with him about her situation. He came out and talked to her. She agreed to return to court in Marty's custody, hoping for a haven under his roof. She agreed to return to court. Um, she felt hoping for a haven of roof. In the meantime, Marty felt she was in good hands. Before Marty left, he and I smoked a joint with us in uniform. The next day was Saturday. Paul had left early on an errand. Car Carla was sleeping upstairs in Paul's room. At about 9 a.m., she and I, in separate rooms, were awakened by a pulsing, punishing sound. Whoomp, 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 whoomp. Sounds of a U.S. Army Huey helicopter hovering less than 300 feet directly over our house in the middle of a fig orchard in suburbia. The din was so loud we had to yell at each other head to head in order to hear and be heard. There was no one in the adjoining houses not uncommon with our busy schedules. We could only, I could only imagine what the residents of the suburban houses 100 yards away across the road might have thought. The chopper was leaned over, a soldier was strapped in the open side gun hatch snapping pictures of our house. As far as they were concerned, we were the enemy, and therefore a legitimate target. Aside from flying the finger at them, I didn't know what to do. Carla said, I know how to get them come down closer. She went upstairs and climbed out on the Paul's bedroom window, out onto the roof of the first story of the house. She languidly stripped off her blouse and showed the army boys what they were fighting to protect. The excited photographer signaled to the pilot to drop down closer. The chopper was soon another 50 feet lower. I could almost read the soldier's name tag over his pocket as he slammed away, taking pictures of Carla. Carla slowly reached into the bedroom window and deftly pulled out Paul's M1 carbine automatic rifle. She calmly opened fire at the chopper. Shells flew away from her bare arms, torso, and shoulders as fast as she could pull the trigger. She got off eight or ten rounds before the army retreated. I yelled, what the hell did you do that for? Now they're going to be out here busting us. While putting her shirt back on, Carla yelled down, doubt it. They'll have to explain what the fucking army was doing, taking pictures of us from a chopper in the first place. The army must have figured it the way Carla did. The cops never showed up. <laughs> so, um... My life has been one interesting story after another like that. So uh, I have some other, some other, you know, tales I can tell. Um, I think I have one more that I'd like to share. Oh yeah. Let me see. Which I think this is. This is, a, this is about, I went to teach at the University of West Georgia, which was a, a rural, rural university in Georgia. There were interesting students there. It was a lot of the kids there were the first generation of their family to ever go to college. A lot of them were, they were work, working class families mostly. Um, there were a fair number of African American students on the, on the campus. Uh, um, Georgia was starting to make a change in that way. We were about 15, 20 miles outside of Atlanta. So it was somewhat of a commuter campus. Some kids came out there to do that. But this was around the year 2000. This was right at the turn of the century. And I learned some very interesting things about life in Georgia at the time. And this is a, this is a story about how far we, we had to come. So we're talking about the turn of the last, turn of the century. My students at the University of Georgia complained that they were not finding their graded papers in a box by my door. The box was clearly labeled. I talked to the head janitor. Box would say, you know, put your term papers here to be picked up. And then there'd be another box that'd say, pick them up from this other box on the other side. Um, I talked to the janitor. Hey, Ellis, my students don't find their papers in the box outside my door. I labeled the boxes. What's going on? Ellis sighed and said, them labels don't do you no good, Mr. Eyes. He called me Mr. Eyes. Ellis pronounced my name Eyes. Why not? Probably a third of my crew can't read or write. They think them papers is a box of trash. So a third of the janitors that work at a university couldn't read or write. Probably a third of the I sent a letter to the governor of the state demanding a literacy program be available to these men and women as part of their employment at the university. I'd bet a plate of cheese grits that the word of this letter got back to my boss. This process was probably the torch for my burning. 
For this and a list of unacceptable conditions and incidents, Steve Ernest, myself, and three other professors over half the p department resigned at the end of the year. I was sure that any place else would be better. So we all talk about a situation here, which I say, um, a lot of people talk about the civil rights movement. We all talk about the civil rights, you know, important part of history. But you have to ask yourself, in a country that's supposed to be free and equal, isn't it a shame that we need a civil rights movement? What the heck? You know, I mean, yes, it's, it's good to be part of it, but it's a shame to have to spend your life doing that in the first place. And I think that's important, that the people who protest that should be put to shame, the people who are dragging their feet about that. And that pretty much goes back to my mom's thing about giving people what they deserve. Uh, those are a lot of some of the stories. The book is chock full of those, and I think, uh, I think you've gotten the gist of it. Most important thing, I think, from this book is that an important person, an ordinary guy, ordinary suburban guy like me, can find himself in the thick of it just by looking around at what's going on. And I think that we have an obligation and a great opportunity here to find opportunities to interact with young people you know, inject ourselves into situations because they have been detrained from the importance. You know, we're old school. Yeah, well, when you're going to enter war, you want to talk to the generals that won the last one. So it's very important they interact because you can be sure that the people on the other side are talking to all the old war horses about the manipulative techniques and what they're doing. We have to really make an effort to inject ourselves into those circumstances. If you have young people in your family, if you have an opportunity to, to volunteer at a school, um, talk with them, listen to them, hear what their fears and concerns are. The main one for them is, uh, is uh, defining and, and, and finding credible and, and respectable information. Who do, you who do you trust? Who do you listen to? Because the concept of credibility is one that you know, uh, has to be verified. The idea that you look to the source of the information. And I think that that that's probably the most powerful and important legacy we can do, which is write books, write music, but interact with them personally for them to get over that disconnection of talking to somebody that, 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 that's older. We really need, that's got to be our legacy at this point in time. I really feel that. Okay. Um, uh, can I answer any questions for anybody? I want to ask a question. Go ahead. He may have to. You going back on the mic over there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, what you know, uh, you had the courage enough to walk against the wind. This culture is trained not to do that. What do you do to suggest to the public at large to uh, what can I say? Give them the courage to walk against the wind because, I mean, I, I've taught in the school of everything from kindergarten through college, right. and by the time a kid hits the third grade, they've already started to die. They're already, they're already teaching them not to, not to, you know, buck uh, the system at all, and they already started, you know, walking in lockstep. What can you do to inspire them to have the guts to walk against the wind? Because obviously, you've been spending a lifetime doing it. I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, I thought about that a lot. I, I have a bookstore. My wife and I run a bookstore. We see a lot of young people. We see a lot of high school kids. Uh, they're in there a lot because there's a high school right around the corner. They come and hang all over the furniture at lunchtime, which is great. Uh, and they share with me this business about being afraid to, to find information on what to do with that information. How do they, how do they interact? How do they connect, you know, turn off the computer and, and connect with the world, or connect with the world through the computer? It seems to me that it becomes a question of, and this is just a very f kind of flip answer, but I think there's, I feel there's something here. It seems to me that the definition of self-interest has been turned inward. When I grew up, and of course a previous generation, uh, the concept of what is good for me is that I look out for you, because we're all in this together, was the air we breathed. 
you're not going to attack me if you're healthy and safe and warm and happy. So if you, if you have what you need and what you deserve, and I helped bring that about, that is in my self-interest. And I think getting people to have the reaction or the system of thinking in that way, oh, what can I do to make things around me safer? I'm more secure in a world that everybody's looking out for each other. And it's biblical. There's a line in the Bible that says, or that, you know, the Lord helps those who help themselves. If you define that in the singular, you have the problem we have in our culture today. If you define that in the plural, then you have socialism. If we all help to ourselves together collectively, we're in a hell of a lot better shape. And I think that ethic and the history of that ethic, and the importance of that ethic, um, needs to be in the schools. It needs to come from the churches. It needs to be in, 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 the, in the music. It needs to be there uh, much more. And, and, and everybody's going, oh, well, that's somebody else's job. Don't think so. If you can write, if you have, if you have a music group, you know, you need to write about that. You need to talk about that. It's, it's a concept of love. It's a concept of caring. And, and I think that that will cause people to rethink their priorities in terms of their politics and in terms of something else. And I, it's a, it sounds like a panacea, but the beginning is to think about what's good for the other person because that's, that's going to come back on me. That's going to come back on me. And, and I think that that's the only thing I can offer, you know, quick and dirty under these circumstances. Well, that goes and I was talking to Paul about the we of us. I come from, as I say, a culture that is a little bit different than what's happening. When I grew up in New York, everybody on the block that you lived on was your parent. Everybody looked after each other. That's before they uh, supposedly desegregated uh, 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 things and, and people moved off to suburbia and what have you. So on one block you would have everybody from from the pimp to the judge to the lawyer and what have you. But everybody on that block was your mama and daddy. And I always say Poppy had periscopic vision because he would know by the time I got home who I did not say hello to. And even though my father didn't believe in physical violence, right. I had gotten whipped by everybody on the block because I hadn't said hello to Mr. Jones or, or Mr. And Ms., Ms., Ms. Reyes or whatever. And that kind of thing has disappeared with this code of I, I, me, me. Yeah. It's no longer about the we of us. So my question is, how do we generate those interactions? This is, this is about knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, uh, you know, I got a, I got a extra plate of brownies here. You want to come over and have some, you know, interacting. Food is a great, food is a great commu communicator. Food is a great organizer. You know, maybe uh, maybe uh, doing potlucks with your neighbors, but get get people to understand that they do share uh, the concerns with those people because we're all sitting there wondering what's going to happen next. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. And uh, here we all are searching for ways to to do that. Uh, I know that some of you have your organizations that you're working with and they're powerful. And you look at around the room of those organizations and say, okay, how many young people are here? And how do we expand that group? Because that's, I mean, if we care about them, we'll take the trouble to do that. We'll take the trouble to do that. Because uh, they're not going to get it. They're not going to get it on their own. Some of them may come to it and realize what's missing. But we want to make sure that it's a large percentage. That's, that's a lot of what I have to share. Anyway, a lot of that is in the book. There's more stuff in the book. There's a, there aren't any recipes in the book, but there are some, <laughs> there's some fun stories in the book. Good. And they are for sale here. Um, um, there's in several bookstores around. Yes, sir. So maybe you can talk about, you know, uh, your art theater at San Francisco State. Good. What was going on there. And, okay. And, uh, that was an interesting, struggle. that was a good learning for me. During the strike at San Francisco State, um, the theater department, the, the issue of the strike was relevance. It was relevant to education for the black and brown third world students um, where, uh, you know, probably 3% uh, of the population was, was uh, white at that school and, um, I mean, 3% was African American and Latino at that school and um, in the city there were 75% uh, of the population of the city was non-white. So it was really out of kilter. So uh, that, that was the strike, was about that. The drama department was also going through a relevance issue. Um, there were no plays about civil rights. There were no plays about uh, uh, black and brown students. There were no plays about labor. There were no plays 
um, about uh, uh, gay issues at the time. There were no plays that connected that theater department. They were all doing old chestnuts, you know. And, um, and, and so the students in the, in the San Francisco State Drama Department held a meeting and said, you know, we have the same issue of relevance. You know, it's, it's tied, it's connected. We voted to support the strike and we decided to go one further. We decided that we were going to boycott all of the productions that the university was doing um, and go off and do some of our own, which, which we did. They did some other ones. The other thing they did was, I mean, I'm standing there and I'm a new, I'm a first semester grad student. And I said, you know, I used to do a lot of skit writing in high school. I could write some agitprop theater skits that, uh, that we could do at uh, supermarkets, we could do downtown, we could do, we did them at City Hall, we did them a lot of places to, to organize for the strike. So we did that. I wrote those skits and we organized, we booked we booked those performances. I used the theater department's office. The guy who was the chair of the theater department was, a, was an, old, uh, an old lefty from, from, from the South, and he let me use the theater department office. So I'm on the phone booking these performances all over the state. One afternoon I'm in there and all of a sudden the secretary, there's a smoked glass door between, this wall between the inner office and the outer office, and all of a sudden she throws herself up against the door. I can see the back. It looks like a bug on a windshield. Throws herself up and she says, if you want to bust him, you're going to have to go through me. Well, they didn't have a female officer to frisk her and cuff her, so they had to go find a female officer somewhere, <laughs> which means they had to find, they had to find a rent-a-cop somewhere because there weren't any female officers in the police department. So she's in there. She's laying, she turns around and opens the door and she says, uh, the only way they could have found you and know you were here is if the university had allowed them to tap the school's phone system. So they're listening to all of the campus phone calls. And then she said, I guess I'm not going to tell any more dirty jokes on the phone. So I had to get out of there and not do that. But I did that and the, those things became very important. When Governor, uh, when Governor Reagan at the time uh, talked about uh, other campuses supporting the strike and off-campus agitators going to those campuses. They were talking about the theater department showing up at those colleges, doing those things, and then those campuses would go out on strike, you know, support the strike. So uh, you can't get any better, better billing than that. So that's kind of what we did. Inside of that time, the theater department had started a radical, th did a radical theater festival where Bread and Puppet of New York, Teatro Campesino, and the Mime Troupe did some performances, and, and, and those three theater companies walked out of that conference and did stuff outside because they we're not going to support, we're not going to have you people come in the building, there's a strike going on. And, and at that point, I talked to Luis Valdez, I talked to Danny Valdez, and they said, we're moving from uh, Del Rey, which is a tiny little town, we're moving to Fresno, um, would you be interested in joining us? Because they needed a tech person and somebody with some simpatico. And I think Luis remembered me from San Francisco State. So that was when I moved down and joined them. But that was the beginning of that understanding of the power and the value. Then I started studying uh, labor theater and, and how that was part of the 30s and even goes farther back than that. Um, so that was a lot of what that, that work was about. Um, to take that opportunity, when you've got an audience in front of you, you have a great responsibility and an opportunity to do something with their time which leaves them more fed and more, more nourished than just you know escapism, uh, uh, and so I took that responsibility uh, uh, seriously, and had opportunities to work with, did progressive theater in all the colleges that I worked at, had my own theater company for a while, worked with some of the companies in San Francisco. I had the opportunity to work with every African American theater company in San Francisco and Latino in San Francisco from. 1981 or 82 through uh, about 98. So I worked with, uh, with all of those companies and, and supported them and gave them uh, help. I'm the only white member of an organization called LATA, Latin American Theaters Association. I'm the only white guy. So, uh, uh, um, so my, my, my contribution was respected and, and honored. So uh, uh, it's important for, for theater writers, for any artist, you know, like I said, a musician, theater writer, painter, poet, um, whatever, to inject that into their work so people look at it and say, oh, that's for me. That's, that's for me. I should be paying attention to that. If you leave it out, they're not going to get it. You can't assume that they're going to figure make those connections. They have to put them in there. So that's, uh, that, that's really uh, got started at that point. Oddly enough, many years later, I had a dinner with my dad 
who was really upset with me being involved in the theater. I took him to dinner when he was, uh, I was about 23, 24 years old. I said, what did you want to do when you were my age? I never asked him that question before. And he hung his head and he said, I wanted to be involved in the theater. And of course, in the Depression, that was not a real opportunity. What he had done was he had joined the labor stage in 1934 at the 14th Street Labor Theater run by uh, Yves Julien. So my father was involved in labor theater, and I never knew that. It was like recapitulation time. So he was proud that I had done that, but wanted me to be able to earn a living and pay off my student loan, you know. So, so, uh, uh, so there was a kind of grudging respect from him for me, for me doing that. But I didn't know he was involved in the labor theater. Then I find out when he was in his late 80s, I found out that he, that he and my uncle were actually CP connected. He was involved with the Communist Party. So I grew up never even knowing that, you know. Maybe that's why they moved from D.C. So what a family, what a family. So that's where those connections are. And I think sharing that with younger people is crucial. It's a survival issue at this point. I really must say that. Okay. Well, I think, you know, one of the important things about this book is that you've written it. A lot of the stuff that you talk about in the book and that you've talked about this evening, um, a lot of folks don't know, and they need to know. They, it's like this stuff sort of just happened and disappeared. Like I mentioned, that guy Hassan, who is a major mover and shaker as far as what we call jazz, right. uh, but nobody knows about him. I think that there's so much stuff we talk about. Okay, uh, my friend from the union here, I'm, I belong to the musicians' union. Well, that's a good thing now. But there was a time when if you look like me or Earl Garner, you could not be part of the Musicians Union. That's right. There are people that did some interesting things, like there was a movement all across the country, like there was Detroit Free Jazz, AACM in Chicago, uh, UGMA down in L.A., all over the country, where we started our own unions. And it forced the Musicians Union yeah. into dealing with the reality, hey, that not only <laughs> did they need us, Right. but that they were cutting themselves short by not having us because yes. we embarrassed them. We were successful doing it. And so I think that what you're doing in this book is you're putting the seed out there. And what can you do? Can you get this book into the colleges, into, into high schools, so these kids can actually see what has laid, led, led the, what, what, what was the seeds that planted, even to be in the schools that they're in, you know? The departments at the end didn't even exist, some of them, right. without somebody breaking their neck to have the, you know. So how do you, how do you get to, I'm trying to figure a way to let these people know, these kids know, what is going on so that we can keep growing rather than stagnating, because that's what I see happening now. Somebody needs to offer me a movie deal. That's what <laughs> Okay, I'll be good. teaching tomorrow. Good. Oh, I'll let me sign that for you before you take oh, right off. On. Thank you. Okay, I've, I've, I've done all the damage I can do here, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm happy to uh, to sell some books. And uh, let me get your, what's your name? Uh, James. To, James Dan, D-A-N-N. To James. 